Good evening, welcome to Studio Q. I'm Stephen, with me is Andrew. Hi. Michael. Yeah. And Mark. Good day. And we're here again to discuss the current affairs of recent times. First off the mark, we have the um, University of New England uh, points this um, student association has just appointed a heterosexual officer to defend the heterosexual rights. What do you yeah, think of that? Well, can I just jump, jump in, in first? Of course you can. <laughs> I, I read the article too, and I wasn't quite sure whether he was is going to be a, the gay liaison type officer, but happens to be heterosexual, or he's some student union guy. Because I don't understand no, the facts. No, 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 no. no. Do you There's see what no, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's not the gay liaison officer. There isn't one. He is a. It's a really right wing student union and they haven't appointed a gay liaison officer or a female women's rights officer or anything. They've appointed a heterosexuality rights officer to protect heterosexuals. You've got to be kidding. No, that's, now, that's you, the story. Even Barnaby and, and, Joyce has said that it's a waste of money. He suggested they give the money to charity. <laughs> and the guy is like a super roux shooter. Like he's really, he's really Well, do they angry. feel that, um, how can I put it, threatened? Well, they must no. do. Oh, <laughs> no, it's a, it's a response. Like they've heard of gay, queer officers all around the country at unions yeah. and they're going, right, let's, you know, let's show them they've got no right, what a waste of money, let's do a heterosexuality. Isn't right. this a place of equal opportunity though? I say give the straight people their officer. Yep. I mean, so we all like a man in uniform. And actually, it, it probably has publicised the fact that there are gay liaison officers at all unis around Australia more to a wider audience than ever before. Yeah, but, the, but then we're a minority in any given yeah. situation. Hello, heterosexuals are and the majority. If they, they must have any number of, of counselling or, or yeah. different areas that they could go to. No, true, true, true. Like, there's no need for his role, no doubt at all. But um, And I, do, I did um, but why read not? where he said he was against um, gay people having their own space yeah. in um, campuses. He's saying, well, colleges. just go down the pub and have a drink with him. So what they need to do is get all the gay people to go down the local pub and snog each other and see what reaction <laughs> they get and then make, see if he can stop all the fights happening. It'd be quite interesting. True, true, true. true. I, think, I think my doctor would see me a lot more often, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> if that were the case. I think it does show that they, they just don't really understand what the issue is. I mean, if you have a heterosexuality officer, I mean, what sort of inequality is he going to try and address? Nothing. You know, there's nothing it's, for him to address. It's just he, a statement against, they're saying we don't need gay ones. Well, he, he did say the article, like, they said, what are your duties? And he goes, ah, uh, none. Yeah. They haven't decided <laughs> them yet. So even the heterosexuals don't know what they actually need in terms of yeah. a heterosexual yeah. officer. That's where they can come to us and look for a role in exactly what straight people need. <laughs> exactly. I mean, gay people, they've got counselling, they've got health professionals. I mean, straight people do, but it's all closeted. There you go. Ah, that's very deep. Actually. I think that was a good end to that story. <laughs> yeah, I'm not touching it. <laughs> <laughs> now, the other news is um, the IR reforms that keep hitting the main headlines. Um, now, the government has said there will be $4,000 to help anybody that thinks they've been uh, unfairly Fairly dismissed, dismissed, but it doesn't include the gays and lesbians or the transgender people. Oh, wow. Uh, hmm. What, do you mean if you were sacked because you were gay? For those yes. Or yeah. that you happened to be gay and no. there was... No. If you sacked for, if you gay, believe you were sacked gay. because of your sexuality, the four thousand dollars legal assistance will not be available well, to you. Well, that's what I love because it's it's what you believe. So you could believe you were being sacked before being gay, but you could then go say I was just sacked for being too pretty, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which would be my case. Yes, thank you. <laughs> of <Mark>. course, Mark. <laughs> Is, that's that's same old same old from the held government. I mean, it's it's not surprising, and you know, it'll change one day, but. Mm. It, it, it just while. just seems to be un, unnecessary that they, they keep petty. admitting, you know. Yeah, yeah I, I think that is. Just and what has the Labor Party come out and said about this? Well, I th well they sort of va in a veiled attempt, I think they're trying to say that it's not the right thing to do. But at the moment, the ALP seem to be equally as friendly with Christian, Christian totally conservative groups. Totally ineffective, aren't they, they at are, the moment? Well, I mean, <laughs> to call it an opposition is well, a bit well, of a stretch the, of the word, isn't it, really? Now, that's the key <laughs> word. Well, it is the key word, isn't it? Because... Um, Democracy depends on an effective opposition. Uh, opposition. Yeah, I agree. And at the moment, um, every time they seem to get over their own internal troubles, the Howard government's very good at, you know, just putting I, well, them I just back into that. They just do not seem to have the courage to stand up 
and say something different to what the government says. They think if we say that, no one's going to elect us. Well, my well, personal opinion is they're small L liberals. Well, I agree. The Labor Party they're is. They're very close, the two mm. parties. That's and they've sure. got to actually define themselves more. ALP, yeah. the Alternative Liberal Party. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> very good. And I know there are a few individuals within the Labor Party, and I would specifically say Lindsay Tanner, right. as someone who's um, aware and um, caring and that, and has an opinion and is willing to express it, particularly about the um, GLIBT community. Okay. But the rest of the uh, Labor Party kind of freaked me out a bit. Well, I think they <laughs> tend to, he tends to be in a minority, from my, in my opinion, mm. for Labor. I mean, yes, he agreed with what you say about Lindsay Tanner, but some of his um, counterparts don't seem to be that forthcoming. I, I mean, think they have loud voices. Their job's to get voted in, and if they think they have to sell people up the river to do it, that's they'll only it. a minority, they'll do it. That's, mm. that's politics. But when there's no difference between the two, how do they ever expect? to get voted in because yeah. people are only going to say, let's stay with the horse we know. Mm, exactly. Rather mm -hmm. than change horses in midstream because there's really no difference between the two. They're yeah. not offering anything different. No. no. And that's because it's been effective opposition. Maybe Latham was going to be their point of difference, but <laughs> it didn't really. <laughs> I don't well, think this, we wanted to make different. Is, getting back to the, the actual topic we're talking about, <laughs> yeah. industrial relations, this is something. I mean, the union movement's doing yeah. more than the Labor Party Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Well, isn't this, this you, um, the whole new policies on the union movement and trying to abolish them. Isn't this part and parcel of trying to actually cover the union union, therefore making us like have less rights? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? I think there are certain segments of the Labor Party who want nothing to do with the unions I anymore. I think that's right. Yeah. And they prefer that they possibly. weren't tied up with the unions. And I think it's time that, um, quite frankly, the unions turn around and start a new Australian Oh great, it's all we need. Labor more, more parties political parties. Better word, you know. The new, the new Labor have Australian New Labor. Mm. <laughs> anyway, moving on, Michael, yes. you had something to say about I the did. Catholic Church. Well, well, quickly, you know, they're, they're doing a huge, um, what, what can I call it, purge at the moment in the Catholic Church. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, they're trying to, in effect, they're going to basically kick anyone out who's gay, openly gay, any priest, any wow. lay worker. I, I guess they're sick of the, uh, the lawsuits. <laughs> but what I found interesting was the, the connotation that by being gay you're also a pedophile. Yeah. They like doing that, don't they? They do. And that, uh, I, I mean, there's two ways of looking at it. You can say, look, you're a priest, you took this oath for celibacy and all that. So these are the rules of the Catholic Church. You don't like it? Get out. And then there's the other argument, of course, that, hello, time has moved on. Yeah. And these are these restrictions on people are, are, are well, it's just not realistic. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, if you're a Catholic and homosexual in a Catholic church, isn't that like a bit of an oxymoron anyway? It can be. Mm. If you if you want to see um, learn about being gay and a Catholic, there is a blog, and I think it's Dreadnought, and it's about a gay conservative Catholic, and he's got some very interesting viewpoints on these issues. People are quite complex and you know can put all sorts of strange things together and believe them and accept them. So. Mm. Well I'm going We're from the Catholic things. Church because I'm going to, oh, this is already. a really complicated subject yep. I know, but to you can pick up the analogy for yourself at home, I'm talking about the New York Zoo. Oh, right. what's been going on in the New York Zoo? Analogy is there. that a nightclub? Well no, <laughs> but I'm sure everybody's heard of Silo and Roy. Are no, 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 Sigmund and Roy. No, Silo no, no, and Roy. No. Okay, tell us about Silo and Roy. These are two gay penguins at the oh, New okay. York Zoo, right? English. And they've been in a long-term relationship. I kid you not, <laughs> six years, these two blokes, well, two penguins, have been going out together. They're well, well, wouldn't you know, they transferred some bitch from the San Diego <laughs> Zoo, her name happened to be Scrappy, by the way, <laughs> and she set her sights on, I think it was Silo, <laughs> right? Well, she's... The mole's gone and got him, hasn't she? And poor Roy oh. is now off to the side. Now, Roy and Silo, this is the interesting part, actually hosted an egg. Oh, wow. S actually okay. sat the egg, hatched it, did the whole whole bit right. Oh, so they can't do that. You don't have gay parenting in the USA, do you? And they had a son. Well, they had a son called Tango. Oh, OK. <laughs> well, it takes two to Tango. That's an appropriate name. <laughs> so, but funnily enough, Tango is also gay. <laughs> and has had a two-year monogamous relationship with Suzumi. It's in the genes. So Roy's only comfort at the moment is that his son... <laughs> oh, no, it's wrong. <laughs> ..is in this 
you know, one-on-one oh. -on -one male relationship, and he's quietly by himself. Oh, Silo's gone down the slippery slide to heterosexuality. I'm pretty sure there was also a, a zoo in Europe that had some gay penguins as well. But they penguins. Be, penguins? Well, they're a funny know, bunch. I don't no, have a favourite. Penguins have that sort of gay look about them. I'm just not surprised. <laughs> but they were like pin-up <laughs> post. They, these are children's book. Penguins. Yeah, they were. There was a children's book put out about these Silo and Roy. Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> this is big time stuff, though. And so you well, can imagine people. They're, show, they're showbiz penguins. That's different. Oh, oh God. God. I think I think yeah, that's a, a nice light note to end it on. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. We'll see you next week on Studio Q. I'm Ciao. Stephen. Bye. Thank you. Want to meet your dream date? Want to come on TV and have some fun? Then it sounds like you need to be a contestant on Bent TV's new dating show. A cross between perfect match and cyber dating, with quite a few fun twists along the way, it promises to be a lot of fun. To apply as a contestant, phone us on 9517 0125 or drop us an email to feedback at benttv.org.au. Leave us a message with your name, phone number and email address and we will get back to you and send you a survey form to fill in to work out your best match. We hope to meet you soon here on Bent TV for a lot of fun. And yes, we're here in uh, Studio Q once again, talking religion and spirituality this week, and we're welcoming a Melbourne icon to our show. She's been around for quite a number of years in the Metropolitan Community Church, doing brilliant work. It's Reverend Heather Crichton. How are you going, Rev? I'm well, thank you. Beautiful. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And I thought we'd just start off with a little bit of your personal journey and how you came to be in the church in this vocation. Um, can you tell us how you started off in life? Um, okay, I started off in life coming from a very large family mm -hmm. in New South Wales, um, very much um, unfortunately involved with alcoholism mm -hmm. and with child protection. Um, found myself as a seven-year-old in a, in a home for girls because my mother couldn't look after me and my brothers and sisters. Uh, from that home, which was a Christian home in, um, in Singleton, um, I probably had my first taste of church because we, we lived across the road from the church, so I went to church on a regular basis there. Um, when I was 10, I was fostered out by a Christian family and, and then continued my journey in the Anglican church. Um, and understanding and, and growing up there as a teenager, I learnt all the rituals and all the prayers and, and, and probably had a childlike faith. Mm. You know, I, I knew there was something there that I had to keep going and, and um, the Anglican church at that time gave me what I needed in the way of part of my faith journey. Um, my, my husband at that time wasn't that fond of going to church, so he was a, what you would call the special Sunday Christians, but I, I was quite happy to go. We had two children. Um, I'm a mother of um, a son who's 28 and a daughter who's 26. Um, my husband and I had a very casual, friendly relationship rather than when we look at it, it was probably not a husband and wife, it was more like a brother and sister. And oh, we often nice. talked about that, that you know, we're very comfortable in each other's presence. But um, there was obviously something that wasn't quite right now at that stage what it was. And it wasn't until um, I think I was about 32 and I met a woman. Well, and that changed our whole life. I have heard that it does do that. <laughs> it does do that sometimes, yes. I met a, a woman and we decided that we loved each other and wanted to share our lives together. Mm. And so then we went through, I went through the trauma and so did she of, of deciding of how we were going to do that. And, and in my case, it meant that I, I left my husband mm. and uh, a very, very distraught husband. And I left two young children in his care um, and moved to Queensland. Um, at what point did you come to the MCC? Like, how long was it after the realisation that you were, were gay? Well, I didn't even know we were gay in those days. I guess my partner and I at the time thought that we were the only lesbians around. Mm. And I think a lot of a lot of people, when they get together in their first relation, believe or feel they are the only ones. And, and you know, where everybody knows about us. Right from the very start, I was always out. I was always open. I, I was in the nursing profession, which I think, um, in most cases, um, are, are fairly accepting people. And, and you know, I, I refused right from the very beginning to talk about my partner as a, a third person. It was always her. Mm. I always acknowledged that I was lived with a woman. She had a, she had just um, converted to Catholicism. Mm. 
So that was interesting to start with. So, yes, it was a big minefield for her. And um, we went searching for a church because both of us knew we needed something, we needed input from elsewhere. So we both we searched for a church in the in Queensland town that we lived in, and we went to a number of different churches, didn't find what we were looking for. Went on holidays to Sydney, and I knew MCC existed, so we went to MCC in Sydney and absolutely loved it. I loved it. Um, and, but we didn't continue going because where we lived in the in Queensland, there wasn't an MCC. I was going to say you um, say you, you tried various churches around Queensland to find your your needs. What was the were you open in terms of your relationship with those churches? And if so, what was the reaction? No, we weren't open. Right. Um, what we would do is we'd go to the church service and and sit there and and probably you can feel the sense. You have a sense of what's happening, mm. and we just sense that no, this isn't a place where we could say who we are. Uh, and be truthful about it. Yeah, I imagine J.B. Yorkey Peterson's Queensland wasn't the time and place to be. <laughs> there was no lesbians or gay people in Queensland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Bjorki made very sure of that, and you know, oh, yes. so that's what he believed anyway. Um, How big is the um, the congregation? Like in Australia, for uh, for uh, example, the MCC congregation. How many members can you boast? Sydney's a biggest church, and I think they have anywhere. But I think they have about 150 members, and they they have two services on Sundays morning and evening. Um, we would be the next largest. We have 37 members, but we have a congregation of around about 40 to 50 each worship on Sunday nights. Mm. Are you finding that your numbers are growing steadily? Is there, is there a need in the gay community for, uh, for that spiritual, I don't know, gap to be, to be filled? I think there's a need in each and every one of us mm. um, to find our spiritual roots, to find where, what we want to believe in, where our faith lies. And I think the good thing is that we can look at other religions. In days gone by, you only looked at one religion, and that was Christian. And if it didn't suit you, then you didn't go anywhere else, you didn't look for anything else. But now there is so many other avenues that people can look at. Yeah. And can look, people can look at spirituality without looking through the church, mm. without looking actually at religion itself. Because religion hasn't been really kind, and the churches haven't been very kind to gay and lesbian people over the years, true. and transgendered people. Mm. And there's, there's a fallacy that you, you, if you're gay, you can't be Christian. And it's something that's been said to me, to said to me so many times. But I'm a gay person, you know. God doesn't love me, mm. and, and we get that belief from what we are taught when we're children, and we get that belief from societal's expectations and societal's beliefs. What is this whole shame thing that we're supposed to be afraid of sex and? You that's know. how you keep people in line. Mm. It's called control. Mm. You don't tell them what they've done that's well, mm. or that they've done something good, or, or that they're good people. You tell them what they've done is wrong. It's sinful, mm. and you use the big word God. Mm. God doesn't like it. God can How justify in the hell anything. Do you know God doesn't like it. That's, <laughs> That's exactly right. right That's you know, right. and this is where so many people feel so ashamed and so guilty about their sexuality. Not just gay and lesbian people, heterosexual people. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. what church can you walk into except this one, and you talk about sex from the pulpit? Mm. You know, and we, one of one of our core values in MCC is the integration of our sexuality and our spirituality. Yeah, Both yeah, are gifts from time. God. Yeah. One of the, the stories, of course, that, that's held against us is, well, marriage, and we go on to the marriage thing, of course, and you know, God made marriage for us. Well, God didn't make marriage for anyone. You know, I'm sorry, but marriage has only been a 20, 19th century yeah. thing, 20th century. God had nothing to do with it. Mm. It's a control thing again, and it's men having control over women. Yeah. You must keep people in line. Mm. Otherwise, they might... You know, I mean, how long... It wasn't so long ago that people weren't allowed to read the Bible. Yeah. You know? Mm because they might read something in it. Mm. Only the priests were allowed to read the Bible. Only the holy people were allowed to read the Bible. In this fellowship, we have the priesthood of all believers. So anyone in this church can participate in worship in any way that they feel that they have the skills to do so. So I'm not the only one who preaches. Ah. I'm not the only one who consecrates the communion. Okay. In actual fact, I'd probably be one, I would do it probably one Sunday out of four. All oh, right. I might preach more often, but I, I don't consecrate every Sunday because we believe that everyone has the right because Christ calls everyone to the meal table mm. uh, and doesn't sit there and say, and never sat there and say, you know, this is the only person who can do what I do. Okay. Jesus told us when two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am with you. Wow. Break bread. If we look through the Gospels, Christ went to those people who the hierarchy rejected. Mm. You know, God, Christ ate with what in those days they called sinful women, mm. prostitutes, uh, robbers, tax collectors were bad in those days as well. 
That's who Christ went to, and that's who we, as part of Christian life, should be looking toward. Exactly. And you know, when we look at the hierarchy of our countries and of our parliaments and all that, that doesn't seem to be happening. They're not caring for the people who really need to be cared for. No, they care for their mates with the big wallets and who want their... Anyway, not that well, I'm a cynic or anything about... <laughs> not that I'm a cynic. Do you um, have much interaction with the leaders of other faiths and what sort of uh, reaction do you get from mainstream churches? We have a number of churches in all faiths who are gay friendly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we certainly have an interaction in, in, on a personal level rather than on a professional level. Sure. It's a more personal level. And so what we do is when one of us has an anniversary or something happening, there'll be invitations floating around. The fact is that there are a lot of gay and lesbians in all faiths, mm. in all churches. Today, every day, there's always um, a gay and lesbian person within any faith. Sure. There was, uh, once was said that if, you, if one Sunday every gay and lesbian person and transgender person didn't turn up for church, there wouldn't be anyone in church, <laughs> including the pastor. Yeah, yeah well... <laughs> and that's oh, a God. fact of life. There are mm. so many gay and lesbians within the whole community, mm. and particularly within the, f the faith community, within the churches. Mm. Uh, and it's just sad that they are living a double life. Yep, going back you to know? that whole self-censorship thing again. Yes, mm. exactly, because mm. I want to be in this church but I know what their policy is on homosexuality. Mm -hmm. So if I came out as a gay person, then they will, not they may not want to, but they would have to excommunicate me. They would have to cut me out because the policy of the church says yeah. homosexuality is a sin. Mm -hmm. And yes, the Anglican Church is struggling with it. The Uniting Church is struggling with it. The, the, the Catholic Church is struggling with it. Mm -hmm. And they don't need to be struggling with it. That's the whole thing. If they just take themselves back to truly what Christ wants us, we are all one. Mm. And, and the whole idea of, you know, when we get before God, God's not going to ask us who we slept with. <laughs> God is not going to ask us which church we went to. Mm. God is, uh, is going to ask us, how did, your, how did you help humanity? Yeah. How did you make life better for someone else? That's all we're going to get asked. You know, we're constantly quoted maybe two or three lines from the Bible. Um, totally condemning us, two or three lines out of the whole Bible, condemning our, us for who we are, our lifestyle, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Can we counter that? Is there any way, not to be anti those other faiths or the beliefs, but can we reach out to those other groups and say, you know, hey, that's not, you know, that, that's well and good, but... We call them the text of terrors, <laughs> and they're thrown at us all the time. Yep. Man should not live with women, uh, sleep with men, lie with men, woman shouldn't lie with women. Abomination, abomination. That's abomination, right, yeah. and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah yeah. is thrown up. If people truly read the Bible in the context that is written, mm. which is over 2,000 years ago, exactly. and that's one thing you've got to remember, it's 2,000 years ago. Mm. Something that was written 12 months ago isn't relevant today. Yeah. How can something written 2,000 years ago be relevant in the full context that it's written? Yeah, exactly. Now, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, people tell you, is it's against homosexuality. It's got nothing to do with homosexuality. Mm. In actual fact, one of the greatest crimes that you could commit in that time was lack of hospitality. Mm. And that's Definitely. what that city did. They didn't welcome those strangers and be hospitable to them. Mm. And as Jesus tells us right through the Gospels, you know, if your neighbour needs something, then you offer it to them. Yeah. If you don't, then it's a sin. Mm. Okay. There are many passages in the Bible. They choose the ones that they want to choose. Leviticus is a good one. It's full of vows. You shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do something else, mm. including you shouldn't lie with a man. If they read the next couple of verses, it also says that you shouldn't wear linen and you mm. shouldn't wear red, red mm. and a woman is, is unclean in her period time. Yeah. I mean, do we take any notice of that? Well, we shouldn't. If well, we don't. People do, we shouldn't. We don't. <laughs> no. I mean, how many women, how many women who, who's having her period is told to go home from work? Mm, exactly. You exactly. know, if we were going to stick to the law, then that's what should happen. A woman would have seven days of uncleanliness, mm. and a man who touched her mm. would be unclean. But mm. we don't worry about those sorts of things. Oh, no. Again, we only yeah. worry about what we can condemn, and the Bible's been used to condemn people all the way through. Mm. You know, the Bible was used as a means to support slavery. Yeah. You know? yeah. So those people who want to use the Bible as a weapon against someone else, they will continue to do it, no what, matter what. What will it take to get the mentality past that? Will it ever get past it? It will. It won't. No. Unfortunately for us as human beings, we're very frail when it comes to that. And we, if we fear something, we will find someone to condemn. Mm. And that's all it is. It is fear. And, mm. and when you listen to the statements of people, you know, you can't have gay people marrying because they're going to ruin marriages. Well, sorry. 
the heterosexuals ruined it long before we did. Yes. <laughs> and in actual fact, if you look at most gay and lesbian marriages and relationships when there are children, it's the most loving. Mm. And, and the children, and I think you'll find most welfare workers will also say that, that if you're going to place a child in care, cha place it with a couple, the couple who are loving, whether they're, they're straight or they're, they're gay, it doesn't matter. It's mm. the, the value of their relationship rather than the gender of their relationship. Now, if uh, people want to come along and join in this community at the MCC here, when can they do it? We worship every Sunday at 7 o'clock. We yeah. have a, an open worship, which uh, we have a fairly casual sort of worship service. We have fun in it, mm -hmm. but we also have very serious prayer. We have beautiful singing, mm. lots of music, and afterwards, which is even just as important, we have a fellowship a, um, a supper yeah. where people stand around and talk to each other. And I think that's just as important. Oh, yeah. And it's some people to some people even more important than the worship service mm. because mm. they can actually talk to someone and talk to them knowing that this person is looking at me and whether they know what my sexuality is it really isn't important, mm. but they are accepting me for who I am. Exactly. And that's what, we all, that's what we all want in our lives is to be accepted, particularly by those who are closest to us. That would be nice indeed. That would be lovely. And, and that's what we have to work toward. Mm. Well, the battle goes on. But, Reverend, thank you so much for joining us. You're most welcome, and, and thank you for uh, inviting me. Get along to the MCC, 7 pm Sundays, 271 Burnley, Burnley Street, Street, Burnley. Be sure to tune in next week for a second perspective on religion and sexuality. Also, don't forget to tune in 10 30 pm Thursday night for Face to Face. <laughs>